I'd like to call the December 19th, 2018 Planning Commission hearing to order. Heather, if you call the roll, please. Mr. Granger? Here. Mr. Boswell? Here. Mr. Klee? Here. Ms. Macbeth? Here. Mr. Edwards? Here. Mr. Schaller? Here. Mr. Rogers? Here. Um, the first order of business is approval of the minutes. There's been one name correction, but beyond that, I've had no other corrections. Is there anything else to change the record? Um, Oh, sorry. Uh, on page three, just uh, at the top of page three, it says first Vice, Claire, uh, first Vice Chair Klee stated as an employee of Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. He would not participate in the discussion. Um, I, th I just prefer that to be phrased similar to what I said in the meeting, which was that I had a conflict of interest and therefore um, would not participate in the meeting. I don't want it to read as though I it was some principled objection. It was simply a conflict of interest. <laughs> Thank you. So with that notation, any other changes? Questions? So a motion to approve is accepted otherwise? I move to um, approve the meeting of the regular minutes of 11.14 and the work session minutes of 11.28 as modified. Second. I second. Mr. Granger? Aye. Mr. Boswell? Mr. Klee? Uh, aye. Ms. Macbeth? Aye. Mr. Edwards? Aye. Mr. Schaller? Aye for the regular meeting and abstain for the work session. Mr. Rogers? Aye. <clears throat> okay, we have no consent agenda items. That brings us to the public hearings. The first one is PCR 18-15, uh, the short-term rental program. Carolyn. Madam Chair and members of Planning Commission, City Council requested that Planning Commission review proposed changes to the zoning ordinance to allow the short-term rental of bedrooms to transient visitors and short-term rentals within owner-occupied single-family dwellings with a special exception from the Board of Zoning Appeals so long as the owner meets certain conditions contained in the ordinance. Short-term rentals are currently permitted in the city as a hotel motel, timeshare, or bed and breakfast facilities. There is no limitation in the city code for any of the above facilities to utilize an online platform to book rentals. Except as provided above, short-term rentals are not permitted, is not a permitted use in any of the city's residential zoning districts. I included the state regulatory history in my memo. In your packet, there are two ordinances. The first ordinance contains two sections on short-term rentals. Section 216052 allows the rental of a room in a single family detached dwelling to visitors in owner occupied dwellings throughout residential districts with a special, special, a special exception use approved by the Board of Zoning Appeals in accordance with Section 2197F of the Zoning Ordinance, subject to the conditions outlined in the ordinance. It states that it shall be unlawful to rent to transient visitors except as allowed for in the proposed ordinance and provides for any approval to be revoked for failure to comply with a required condition or for multiple violations on more than three occasions of any state or local or ordinance regulations related to the rental of the bedrooms. <coughs> The second section, 216053, allows the rental of an owner-occupied single-family detached dwelling for short periods of time to transient visitors while the owner-occupant is absent subject to the conditions outlined in the ordinance. A couple of the changes from the first regulation section in this one is short-term rental shall be permitted for not more than 45 days per calendar year. The permissible number of transient visitors occupying a single family dwelling <coughs> that qualifies for a special exception hereunder cannot exceed two times the number of bedrooms being rented to transient visitors, excluding minor children. The Commission has had several meetings on short term rentals since June, and copies of the minutes from those meetings were included in your packet. At your October work session, you requested staff to draft an ordinance for consideration to allow short-term rentals on the six major streets where room rentals to visitors are currently allowed in the city. The second ordinance in your packet allows short-term rentals of a room in a single-family detached dwelling to visitors in owner-occupied dwellings on quarter streets as a business accessory use with a special exception use approved by the Board of Zoning Appeals. <coughs> Rentals must be located on a lot contiguous to the major streets or portions thereof listed below 
and only if the dwelling's front door faces the major street. And these streets are Capitol Lane and Road, <clears throat> from Lafayette Street to Queens Creek, Henry Street between Lafayette Street and Mimosa Drive, Jamestown Road, Lafayette Street, Page Street, Richmond Road between Brook Street and Virginia Avenue. In your packet, I included some maps, and I'll go over those briefly with you. In the section on Capitol Lane and Road from Lafayette Street to Queens Creek, there is 26 single-family dwellings. Of these dwellings, currently there are nine owner-occupied single-family dwellings, 16 rental single-family dwellings, and one dwelling being used as a bed and breakfast. On Henry Street between Lafayette Street and Mimosa Drive, this section contains 10 single-family dwellings. Of these, there are four owner-occupied single-family dwellings, five rental single-family dwellings, and one dwelling being used as a bed and breakfast. On Jamestown Road, it contains 29 single-family dwellings. Of these, currently there are 17 owner-occupied, seven rental, and five dwellings being used as a bed and breakfast. This is the first section to Lake Matoka, and this one is the second section of Jamestown Road. Lafayette Street, did I lose Lafayette Street? Lafayette Street didn't get loaded. Lafayette Street contains 21 single family dwellings. Of these, currently four are only occupied and 17 are rental. On Page Street, it contains 11 single family dwellings. Of these, 10 are owned or occupied and one is a rental single family. Staff would like to note that of the five owner-occupied units are located in Capitol Lane and Green, which may not allow short-term rentals in their covenants and restrictions. Finally, Richmond Road between Brook Street and Virginia Avenue contains 27 single, single, 22 single-family dwellings. Of these, 14 are owner-occupied, two are rental, and six are being used as bed and breakfast. On the six major entrance quarters, there are 58 owner-occupied single-family dwellings, 48 rental single-family dwellings, and 13 bed and breakfasts. Staff notes that for other option, the owner will need to pay BPOL tax and personal property tax for all items being used for the rental per the Commissioner Revenues Office. That's my overview of the two ordinances. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, thanks, Carolyn. Um, before we open up this public hearing, I just wanted to open this for obviously general questions for Carolyn, but also specific questions or clarifications on the draft PC ordinance, because that's the byproduct of what has been several of our work sessions and public meetings so far. So with regard to that ordinance, are there any questions, queries, thoughts that it wasn't capturing what we had gotten to in terms of our discussion? I do have one question, uh, probably for um, Ms. Shelton. Um, I had a concern about the liability insurance uh, covering guests that they're required to have. Um, is, is this language, you think, specific enough um, so that, uh, that staff will be able to require proof? I mean, it, it says they have to have the insurance, but it, I mean, a, uh, a, a certificate or a copy of the, of the policy or something like that isn't necessarily required under this. Will staff be able to ensure that guests using the Airbnbs will be covered by the liability? So part of the application process, they'll have to provide a certificate to the staff to demonstrate that they have the insurance that they're required to have. So, so staff has the authority to vet that. Super. Thank you. Other questions about the ordinance or for Carolyn? Thanks. Okay, well, with that, I'd like to open the public hearing. If anyone would like to come forward and speak to us on this item. Not seeing anyone. I guess I'll close the public hearing. Um, <clears throat> from my um, notes, we have been looking at this issue since a work session on June 20th, which basically makes a six-month uh, process for us, <laughs> December 19th. Um, where is the discussion on this, I guess? Where do people want to go? I'll jump in if that's all right. Uh, I think that this is exactly why we have zoning, um, so that the 
people can have an expectation as to what's going to uh, be next to them, and people uh, won't suddenly have a hotel next to them where they didn't expect to. And so I, I feel like um, what we what's been drafted and before us is is pretty reasonable. It allows for it to take place in our community, but in specific areas. Um, so if someone chooses to move into an area where it's allowed, then they shouldn't be surprised if they've got uh, transient visitors staying next to them. Um, so uh, I've, just like you all, put a lot of thought into this, and I, I feel uh, as comfortable as I'm going to with this uh, because it's in specific areas where a similar product is already happening. So uh, this is why we have zoning, in my opinion. Right, and just to amplify this for people who may be watching or reading the transcript um, on a lonely night. Um, <laughs> but with regard to the comments of this is something that is allowed and we're thinking about making something that is going to then be newly allowed, the this that is currently being allowed is that these corridor areas are places where people can have bed and breakfasts. And so if we're looking at this as a way that a... Um, owner-occupied home can be used to rent out transient rooms that is very similar to being a bed and breakfast and so no one would be surprised by having this kind of a com commercial transaction per se happening in their neighborhood in these corridors. Um, any other comments? I have one from um, the other side of the, the spectrum, as you can say. Is, is motivated by resident Chris Gary's in saying how when approaching this issue, how do you tie it into sort of our, our greater goals? Um, one of the ways I looked at that is I think it would be to the detriment of Williamsburg to have all neighborhood housing suddenly become students. And that's a, certainly a comment that I saw from a lot of residents is that continuously have they, have, as they have lived in the neighborhoods, they've seen more and more of their neighbors and the houses around them go from what used to be the, the nice family towards student uh, or rental properties, usually towards students. And so if it's part of our job to sort of protect this and, and ebb this development flow a little bit, I think we need to consider what options we have in the ways of affordability. And we've been doing that a lot of the ways in, in downtown and midtown with density. And density usually takes a while. And so I think actually that the short-term rental ideas within the neighborhoods, uh, and in this way I'm more of the city council proposed ordinance vein, would actually be very helpful towards affordability and putting people into these neighborhoods so that they can then uh, afford houses or we can even encourage more tourism from there. Uh, before, well, I guess in, in making sure that that issue is transient with the residents, I look at the survey that um, the planning department passed and saw that there was 75% of respondents said that they were okay with the short-term rentals being in the neighborhoods in one way or another, uh, some of which actually being for the full house rental, which personally I'm against, but I found it very surprising that a, a substantial amount of residents were for the full house rental. But just the fact that 75% were for short-term rentals within the neighborhoods, I think is a very substantial response and one that we need to consider moving away from the corridors. Um, maybe just a, a couple to, to, again, try to find a, a way forward where, where we can have something like consensus. I think the, the existing, the, or rather the draft Planning Commission ordinance, I think does capture um, uh, a pretty narrow, narrowly defined consensus from our previous meetings in which uh, we permitted, with some restrictions, one room, single room rentals um, in, in generally the parts of town where we already um, have bed and breakfast. So that seems like a very easy choice for us. I think where we maybe have some more questions is uh, the degree to which, um, I mean, essentially what we're talking about here and what zoning is about is, is limitations on property rights. Is this a, a reasonable limitation on people's property rights? And I think it is. I think the question is, is it also reasonable as, as um, uh, Mr. Rogers is suggesting to expand that further, and I don't think we were able to get consensus on that last time, um, and I suspect we won't we won't today either. Uh, but I think it is worth a further discussion about whether whether we ought to uh, expand that a little bit more when it comes to single room rentals. Uh, and I say that because we've heard. Um, a number of times from a handful of people who have expressed um, a great deal of interest 
and, and being allowed to do this in their own neighborhoods. Uh, and we've heard at the same time, uh, uh, I think, objections from people in some of those same neighborhoods, but also in other neighborhoods, to the idea of whole house rentals. Uh, I've heard personally from people in Skipwith Farms who are um, uh, very upset about the degree to which it seems to be happening, or they perceive it to be happening in Skipwith Farms. Um, by the same token, we've heard from people in Indian Springs and Burns Lane that uh, they would very much like to be doing this and see this, uh, as Mr. Rogers suggests, as a way to um, expand opportunities for home ownership in those neighborhoods as opposed to uh, rentals. So I think this kind of is the way that I understand the problem or where, the way I understand the, the challenge that's in front of us. Um, I'm very happy with the way that the, the existing Planning Commission uh, ordinance is written, but I do think it's worth us considering a little bit further <coughs> whether we ought to um, leave the door open or open the door to uh, single room rentals. Uh, right. So for me, I, I think that um, I think we felt six months ago that we needed to craft something so that we would at least one, show good faith and be tr able to mm -hmm. at least control our destiny at some level with, re yeah. with regard to the General Assembly. Yeah. And so while I think that there are lots of other areas to think about, and I think that it is something we can continue to think about, especially as we go through the comprehensive plan process more broadly, this is the center of that Venn diagram where everyone, I think, can agree that yeah, these agree. areas right. are eligible for this. Yeah. And let's continue to have... A let, let these areas, you know, trial this, you know, mm -hmm. um, and then let's continue to think about the expansion as, as we can think about it more broadly, but um, that this is an area of consensus yeah. um, and that I agree there's not consensus, but there's lots of other ideas about those other areas, but this focal point is something I think that we can move forward with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, no, I agree. Um, and and I, I do think it, it's just worth one last conversation, particularly because, as uh, Ms. Murphy's presentation just illustrated, I, I should have written down the number, it's fewer than 100 um, right. yeah. houses. <laughs> it's closer to 50, I think, yeah. that would actually get to take advantage of this. So that's a pretty small number. Um, I think the people in the community, the people in our community who um, – think that this is something that we ought to be doing, we'll be disappointed that such a small number of houses will be able to do this. Um, and so I just, I'm mindful of that as, as we have this conversation today. I think one thing, um, sort of in between what Mr. Granger said and what Mr. Rogers said, and, and to, to refer that um, we're, we're taking a small step forward, but I can tell you, um, particularly with regard to the survey, for example, um, I was, I, I live in Holly Hills, and we were um, updating our covenants to address this issue and I was at the meeting and um, the, the chair said you know was explaining what we were doing and nobody said anything and I realized that they really didn't actually know what Airbnb was and what we were discussing and so once I explained it they were on their feet oh my gosh this is this is a terrible thing mm. and I think that oh my gosh this is this is a terrible thing it's what we got from a lot of people in Burns and and uh, um, those areas where there are a lot of rentals. So I think this, what this ordinance does is it gives people the opportunity, in these areas designated the opportunity to, to do this, but it also gives everybody else an opportunity to see what it actually means you know, for the neighbors, for the street, and that sort of thing. And I think, I, I think letting, people, you know, let, letting people see that, they may realize it's not you know, the, the end of the world that, that some people sort of, uh, sort of see it as. So I, I think you know, certainly uh, it's the kind of thing, as, as um, Mr. Cleese said, something we could look at again you know, within a year and if, see, see what the public uh, uh, response is to that. You know, should it be expanded further? Because it's certainly much easier to expand it than it is to do something overly broad and then try to rein it back in if it's a problem. <clears throat> I think it's a really it's a good compromise at this point and a good test. I personally think that I can get into the neighborhoods, and I think it'll be uh, useful in some neighborhoods. We just have to sort of see how that goes. It's a very complicated uh, process to decide where and how many. Uh, no, I, I think this has been a really great conversation, and I think as we've learned through multiple conversations now, we know where the consensus lies for most of us here, and it's on the two ordinances that we have before us that we've built ourselves and that Ms. Murphy has helped written. Um, and so, yeah, I agree. I think this is a way to move forward, to start to address the issue and explore what it looks like to have 
legal Airbnb in Williamsburg and to understand what the potential impacts are more while minimizing it to an area that already has a very similar use. So, thoughts? So, final I mean, yeah, one, yeah, just one further question. I, I did, this question didn't occur to me while Ms. Murphy was at the podium, but um, is, um, is it possible for us to um, uh, adjust this ordinance to allow a Holly Hills, for example, should a neighborhood that has um, a neighborhood association in it decide that it's in their interest and what they, they would actually like to allow Airbnb in, um, in their neighborhoods? Because right now we simply say, well, it's, um, it's only in the corridors, but I think what we haven't yet done is open the door to a neighborhood that does have a neighborhood association to permit this in their uh, neighborhood covenants. Is that, is that correct? Or is that something that we could do uh, in this ordinance? Maybe it's Christine. At some point in the future, yes, you could do that. Okay, well, could we do that today, I guess is what I'm asking. Could we allow them to make this decision for themselves expressly? Um, not as it's currently drafted and okay. not without going back and doing some revisions. Okay. The, the ordinance that you requested is specific to those corridor streets. Right, right. That, yeah. But, okay. I mean, as we are also in the comprehensive plan process, we could put this as one of our sort of to-do points with the comprehensive plan to revisit this Airbnb and potentially change this ordinance to include Sub, I mean, neighborhoods that have covenants of their own. Once we get through the comprehensive plan, we'll probably have like two years of meetings of you know, zoning ordinance changes as we roll through the different recommendations. So that's something that we could include in that. Being able to move something forward, which I do think we have some, not only have we been looking at this for six months, but we're also seeing the General Assembly session starting up in six weeks and all that. Having some, you know, I'd like to tie, I personally would like to tie at least a bow around what we've done so far. Yeah. And okay. then we can continue you know, some of these things as we move forward in the next six months, working through the comp plan through the spring, spring months. Okay. I say spring semester, but it's a different part of my life. <laughs> well, just looking forward at, at ways that we can begin to expand this incrementally, it seems to me a very reasonable thing for us to do, to simply say to neighborhoods with neighborhood associations, you may do this should you choose to. We shouldn't, it seems to me, prevent them from doing it if it's something that they actually want. Right. And I mean, a neighborhood to me that seems like it, I have no clue if that's true, but I mean, one that would be like counselors close. They're right, right downtown, yeah. all that kind of stuff. They have their own organizational structure, right. have no clue what they'd want to do, but that would be something. Yeah, it'd be good to be able to leave it up to them. I think it would be interesting to find out um, and what their approval process is for, for something like that, because different neighborhoods are going to have different approval processes, and it might be got to be 100% of the owners to uh, agree to allow this or 75% or something like that. So that's a, a part of that equation as to uh, how they can opt in because, again, I go back to the family that's, that bought the place three years ago. This wasn't allowed, and then suddenly it's allowed, mm -hmm. and they're trying to raise their kids, and they've got transient people coming and going all the time. Um, they didn't buy into that. That wasn't an expectation. This is where this gives me such comfort in what we've got proposed is because nobody should be surprised if there's somebody running a bed and breakfast next to them, whether it's advertised online or not. Right. They've already bought into it, and that's been in place for a long time. So there, there's no surprise taking place. Okay, so we have um, a proposed ordinance that is in front of us that is the result of many work sessions um, and a lot of work on the part of Carol and, and Christina. Is there a motion um, to forward to City Council the proposed PC ordinance or some other motion that we'd like to entertain? Uh, I move that we forward to City Council the draft uh, ordinance uh, as written. Second. And we're dealing with the draft PC, the PC or ordinance, ordinance not yep, the draft so-called, yes. Any further discussion? Mr. Granger? Aye. Mr. Boswell? Aye. Mr. Klee? Aye. Ms. Macbeth? Aye. Mr. Edwards? Aye. Mr. Schaller? Aye. Mr. Rogers? Nay. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Our next order of business is PCR 1832, um, food trucks. In 2016, the city adopted its first food truck re regulations to allow food trucks in the B4 Culinary Arts and Hospitality District. It allows food trucks as, per as a permitted use if located on private property in the district with certain conditions outlined in the adopted ordinance which were attached. A food truck working group was formed in 2017 to establish a comprehensive food truck policy and to evaluate the implementation of any proposed changes to the existing ordinance. In my memo, I included the makeup of the working group. The group was formed to address the GIO to review existing food truck policies and procedures for potential revisions to provide a simple <coughs> and conducive policy that enables food trucks and restaurants to meet the needs of the community while providing a, a competitive but fair environment. After three meetings, the work group reached the following consensus on revisions. The existing public property process is working for criteria for approval should be considered. Expand permitted areas to include LB1, B1, B3, ED1, and ED2. Recommends a 100-foot buffer, restaurant buffer requirement for LB1 and B1 zoning districts. To be allowed in the buffer, at least 75% of the existing restaurant owners must agree for food trucks to be located in the buffer. Remove any residential buffer. Allow food trucks in residential zones of the city at up to two special events a year. Require fire department inspection prior to business license issuance and on each operation day and define a food truck in the zoning ordinance. In your packet is a proposed ordinance addressing the recommendations from the working group. This recommendation for a permissive restaurant buffer recommended by the group is not included in the ordinance. The city attorney has advised that allowing the restaurant owners to directly approve or disapprove encroachments into the buffer area is not permitted as recommended by the working group. She notes that zoning is a legislative act which must be performed by council or in limited circumstances as permitted by the Code of Virginia by the Board of Zoning Appeals. Therefore, staff has written the ordinance without a permissive buffer recommendation. A general restaurant buffer from food truck operation is included. With the approval of special events at the Palace Farm site, staff has also included this property into the approved locations. This recommendation is only for the Palace Farm site and does not include other museum support locations in the city. This map indicates the additional areas outside of residential zones recommended for food trucks, which include the downtown area, midtown area, High Street, Riverside, and the Palace Farm site. The proposed ordinance also allows food trucks in residential zones for up to two special events a year. It defines a food truck, rec recommends a 100-foot restaurant buffer and requirement for LB1 and B1 zoning districts, and requires a, a fire department inspection prior to obtaining a business license and a fire department inspection each day of operation. Outline in this overhead indicates the area outside of the 100-foot buffer downtown. This buffer area will change as restaurants open and close in the downtown. This map indicates the residential areas in the city. The food truck working group was formed to review existing food truck policies and procedures for potential revisions to provide a simple policy that enables food trucks and restaurants to meet the needs of the community while providing a competitive but fair environment. Adding food trucks to these areas will enhance the economic vitality of the city as recommended in Goal 2 of the 2017-18 GIOs. Therefore, staff recommends approval of the proposed food truck ordinance as recommended by the food truck rec working group and modified by staff to add the, the one lot in the MS district. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Any questions for Carol? Um, could, could you just review the, the buffer again? My memory of the 100-foot the, um, the restaurant buffer, my memory from the discussion was that if there was a percentage proposed of restaurants within the buffer that could allow the um, 
a food truck to locate within the buffer. I just didn't see that in the ordinance, and I may that's simply have missed it. That's my portion that, I, that uh, the city attorney has said <laughs> that that's a legislative act and cannot okay. be done by the restaurant uh, owners. It has to be, we could put a buffer, but we can't put inside of the buffer that a certain percentage of the individuals would allow it. So either so it's we buffer allow, or no buffer, It's period. a buffer or no buffer. Okay, thank you. And buffer, the buffer is in there. As, the, as yes. currently written. And this is basically the 100 foot buffer with restaurants. And like I mentioned, that changes every time one opens or closes. Right. And the, and the buffer was a, it was a strong recommendation of the working group? Yes, they looked at 50 foot buffers, 100 foot buffers, 150 foot buffers, okay. a whole range of buffers, and uh, decided <laughs> on that based on the downtown that they were comfortable with the, uh, the 100 foot buffer. And I'm sorry, just to keep pressing on this, and I, I know we discussed it. It was just something that always saw, I, I always saw as uh, complex. Is it measured from the main entrance? Is it measured from the center of the building? It's measured from the building footprint. The uh, building footprint. Great. Thank you. I have a quick comment for uh, the commissioner or anyone listening at home. Uh, Carol and I spoke earlier about Section A3, which says that food trucks Food trucks must be expected each day of operation in the city. Uh, I was curious if that was a bit excessive compared to other localities. And um, Carolyn said that Chief Don, the, the fire chief, was very adamant that he would like to do this and that food trucks that were interested in having their um, operating within the city were okay with that as well. There was a long discussion on that. And because mm -hmm. of the, the small size of the city, the mm -hmm. city's fire department could get to the individual trucks easily every day okay. and they recommended it was more important for safety to inspect them every day because when a truck leaves the site and, and comes back the next day the connections could uh, loosen on the gas and those kinds of things and they felt mm -hmm. more comfortable having uh, an inspection every day and the food truck operators were in support of that. I've got a question about the, the discussion that occurred um, with sort of the food truck uh, group and I was wondering why Second Street didn't make the cut uh, for, for they the didn't list. look at the B2 district okay. because the B2 district had restaurants that were closely together there weren't areas where people could gather say like at High Street or Riverside where you can maybe have a, a festival like High Street has two or three times a year certain uh, Cinco de Mayo I think is one of them and there's not wasn't a big gathering area that you could do that and that was one of the reasons they didn't include the B2 district okay great thanks is the $50 application fee a single time it's an application so if you came in and had a food truck in in high street say for a special event in May and you had another special event in Riverside in December, you would pay the, the fee again. That's to help cover the fire department making the inspection and, and administrative costs. Do they collect taxes? Yes. They're supposed to keep count of the receipts that they have in, at that location and pay taxes to the city for those receipts that are, that are the food that's sold in the city. That leads me to a question. Uh, in the definition, uh, it's a large wheeled vehicle from which food is sold. Yes. Um, I don't know how to define large, but if somebody uh, had a little hot dog cart and they were selling hot dogs out of it, does, is that a food truck or is that not a food um, truck? discussion on <laughs> what qualified that and it was left open a little bit for the zoning administrator to make a determination okay. that sometimes you see different looks of vehicles and different sizes of vehicles. Like if you had a... Uh, sometimes you can tow something behind right. or something mm -hmm. that... that right. You know, right. So the food truck group said it was best to leave that a little loose so that the zoning administrator could always make a determination based on the actual vehicle. And if the... Act, the person didn't like the zoning administrator's determination, they could always appeal that to the Board of Zoning Appeals and, and uh, get a ruling from the Board of Zoning Appeals if the zoning administrator acted in accordance or not. So they, we left that a little open. We didn't want certain little small like uh, 
ice cream cart or something to be called a large wheel vehicle. But, I, mean, that's <laughs> exactly. I was actually thinking about the King of Pops, the King right. of Pops at the farmer's market. I mean, they're like a, like a small thing like right. that ice cream vehicle. And that's a special event, and then right. you can get a special event permit from the city manager's office to operate that type of equipment. But we were looking at more of the traditional looking food trucks where you sell things from than, than that. Okay. The next piece that I wondered about was uh, food is sold. So if someone hired, uh, say, one of the, the, the snow to go to come and paid a, fat, a flat fee to them to, provoke, to give away the product at, at an event, the food was sold prior to the event, no cash is taking, changing hands at the event, Does, is that a food truck? Yeah, I think that's probably how you do a lot of the residential ones is that right. uh, we, we talked about someone having a wedding reception, per se, and they, instead of having a caterer coming in and, and setting up at some location, they could have a food truck and they purchase the food and you just go and get your food from the food truck. And that was one of the things that they talked about in, for the reason for allowing it two times a year in a residential zone a kid's birthday party, uh, those type of small events. But uh, I think you have to sell. It's going to impact right. how the taxes are collected and where they're paid right. more than it will the zoning ordinance. And we've talked about it in the context of taxes and where the situs of the tax is appropriately paid. But if the person is settling up at the end of a day, it doesn't matter if one person is paying the total bill or... 50 people are paying for their individual meals for purposes of this, it would still be a food truck. Okay. Okay. Yeah, well, this is a public hearing, so I'd like to open this up and we'll have more time to discuss. I'm not sure we're going to have a lot of that happening, but just to follow the protocol. So I'll open the public hearing. And if anyone would like to come forward to speak about food trucks, they're welcome to do so. Having taken that intermission and not being uh, <laughs> picked up on it, I will close the public hearing. Caleb, you have a question? Or a yes. Uh, Carol, I just wanted to clarify something that Mr. Klee brought up. So the 75% within the buffer zone is a legislative requirement, or the buffer zone is the legislative requirement? We can't require 75% or 50% or 25%. Oh, that's a legislative act, and okay. that's why we took it out of the ordinance. Okay. And, and I think that that anymore. makes it just much more simple. I mean, right. then you have a per se right to have a food truck in this area. It isn't that you have to, you know, kibitz to get people to vote for you to come right. on this weekend right. or something <laughs> like that. And Carol is trying to things. figure out what's going on or something like that. So this makes it, I think, just Absolutely. clear that you can have a food truck here if there's some kind of event. Absolutely. Other? I think the only other thing worth observing is um, one one point of discussion in the previous uh, uh, meeting about food trucks was, um, and I think I think we all agreed that it didn't make any sense to do this, uh, <coughs> but was to have a, a an owner, a local business owner, being a sort of sponsor or a partner in the food truck, and that's gone. That's not part of this at all, which I think is um, which is excellent. Okay, so we have a proposed ordinance in front of us. I haven't seen any substantive changes. Is there a motion to uh, recommend this to City Council, or am, am I missing some substantive change? I'll move that we uh, recommend PCR 18-032 for approval of City Council. Second. Heather? Mr. Granger? Aye. Mr. Boswell? Aye. Mr. Klee? Aye. Ms. McBeth? Aye. Mr. Edwards? Aye. Mr. Schaller? Aye. Mr. Rogers? Aye. Okay, this brings us to our open forum. If anyone would like to come forward and speak to us on any item that may be coming before us. Seeing no one. There are no other um, <clears throat> items of business for us today. Um, gratefully, Carolyn has relieved us of a work session in December, because that would be next week, um, which I think most of us have other activities on our agendas for that week. Um, we do have um, two public hearings in January. Um, Matthew Whaley School would like to have a second classroom trailer, and we will also have the CIP um, presentation. 
And then also January 23rd, we have a, our next comprehensive plan work session, which is on the economic development study, which actually led me to a question, Carolyn. Usually in January, we have a standing work session dealing with the CIP, since the January work session is now um, <laughs> devoted to the economic development study. When are we going to have that I work? had my sticky note as a question to ask you. Did you want to have it after the the economic development, or did you want to have it the following week, which is January the 30th? Um, I'm not sure everyone's ready to look at their calendars right now, um, so can we get back to you on sure. that? There's enough time to have a public announcement and all, all that, right? Yes. Okay. So um, well, we I'll only offer a, the, the CIP often is a long discussion. Yeah. I, think, I think doing that after um, a discussion with EDA We'll oh. shortchange one or the other. Yeah, we'll no, just, no. We'll I, I think that the January 30th is probably the correct answer to that mm -hmm. question. Um, and I guess why don't we just, in the next day or two before people head off for holiday land, um, decide whether or not there's too many conflicts. I, I want to make sure we have a quorum. But I yep. think that, that that is a broader discussion that we should devote a second or, or, or you know, an individual session. Why don't so. I just uh, shoot everyone an email tomorrow and you just respond yes Perfect. No. Sounds great. That sounds great. Okay. Um, so unless there are any other items for the good of the group, okay, we stand adjourned. Thank you.